And I'll tell you why I'm the way that I am. It doesn't start on the field. It starts as a person. I was dealing with race since I was born. And in my inner self, my strength was unbending when it came to accepting that BS, racial discrimination. Because I was never going to let anybody make me feel that I was not top shelf. And that was the battle that raised. And I could use a lot of that on the field. You gonna be a football player when you grow up? Today is the best day of your life. Believe Give it. Give me 18 years of daylight. That's all right. Greatest leader I've ever known. What a ride it's been. This is Jim Brown, the most devastating ball carrier in the history of football. Most dominant player to ever step on any athletic field. Jim Brown was a titan, which means he was larger than man. He was bigger and faster and stronger than everybody on the field. Considered by most experts as the greatest fullback ever to play the game, Jimmy's harder to bring down than a wild steer. Jim Brown is bigger than life. He feels competitive for justice as he was on the field for excellence. Here's a striking example of his individual brilliance. The creator said, I'm only going to do this one time in a very special player. Eight rushing titles in nine seasons. Three most valuable player awards. Over 12,000 rushing yards. 106 rushing touchdowns. All while never missing a game and retiring at the height of his career. talk about Bo Jackson, Mark Allen, Eric Dickinson, Tony Dorsett, Walter Payton. There's not one trait that they had that he didn't have. He's one. He's one. Payton two. I fall three. <laughs> Guys that are extremely strong uh, may not be as agile. Uh, some guys have all the speed in the world, but may not have the balance. Jim had it all. His principal legacy is going to be what he accomplished as a football player. But Jim Brown was not principally a great football player. Jim Brown was a great man who just also happened to play a great game of football.
Jim Brown was always in motion. Only the lens of a camera could stop him. He left indelible images on Hollywood and as a community activist, but first on the football field in a career that almost never happened at all. I came up in the 50s. Race was always an issue everywhere. And I was the only African-American on the team. It was very difficult based upon the racial attitude of some people. After his arrival at Syracuse in 1953, a frustrated Brown rode the bench. I knew I was the best back there, and they were trying to tell me I wasn't. So I decided I was going to leave. Superintendent of my high school flew up there and told me that I bet I'd quit, stick it out, and it'll work out. And he was right. As a senior, Brown was a unanimous All-American. Halfback Jimmy, first down, Brown picks up that and then some as he breaks loose on a spine-tingling open field gallop and set a then NCAA single game record by scoring 43 points in his final regular season appearance. In 1957, he took his talent to the NFL where he fell to a team worthy of his name. Jim Brown was not number one on the draft list that year. Paul Brown wanted to take Lonnie Dawson, a quarterback, and the quarterbacks he wanted were gone. I guess, well, I guess I'll just settle for Jim Brown. When you're a rookie, you have to step back. But I didn't have to do too much stepping back. In Brown's ninth game, he ran for a then NFL single game record, 237 yards against the LA Rams. The coach liked me. I'll always remember. He said these words to me, you are my running back. You are my running back. Those were uh, the sweetest words I ever heard as a professional football player. Brown's 1957 season was a debut like few in sports history. Rookie of the Year, MVP, a league rushing crown, and all pro honors. But that was just the beginning. In 2016, the Cleveland Browns commissioned an artist to sculpt a statue of Jim Brown. When you get old, people do certain things like this. But I'm a part of this franchise. In my own mind, I'll always be a Cleveland Brown. The organization is, you know, paying a great honor to me. And I truly, truly appreciate it. It's a little humbling because this guy is much bigger than me. <laughs> <laughs> if you watch some of the films, you can see his balance. 
I saw Jim Brown come out of a meeting, and it was in the winter, and he stepped on a piece of ice and slipped. At least for four or five seconds, he defied gravity. I said, this cat ain't gonna even fall when he done slipped on a piece of ice. I played against Jim Brown once when I was with the college all-stars. You know, there was talk and I had heard about Jim Brown, the great Jim Brown, blah, blah, blah. So I thought, you know, here's my shot at getting this legend. So some way or another, my arm got caught under his and he started rolling the other way. And it's, you know, hyperextending my arm and I'm like, hey, you son of a, <laughs> I thought, Damn, this guy is not bad. Jimmy Brown again, all 228 pounds, bowling through the middle and thundering 68 yards for the fourth score. As enormously gifted as he was as a physical entity, his mental approach to the game was even greater. Very smart, understood blocking schemes, understood running styles, understood the whole game. Every time the play was over, Jim Brown would get up and he would be the last one to stand up and he would go back to the huddle very slowly. And then he'd get in the huddle and I'd think, my God, he's got to be hurt. And then he would just explode. It's twofold. The opponents don't know when you're hurt if you get up slow all the time. And the other is the conserving of energy. You don't want to be jumping up, running back to the hull between plays, and you're fatigued to a certain degree. God gave all of us the ability to think, and you imply intelligence to everything that you do. So I like the physical aspect of it, but the mental aspect of it was much more important to me. Brown had skill and intellect at a level few had ever seen. So was his influence in the locker room. I was placed on waivers. So I was packing up and Jim came by and he said, let's go to practice. So I said, man, you see I'm packing my He said, what do you mean? I said, I'm packing my because they put me on waivers. He said, stay here, you left. He came back in about 45 minutes. He said, let's go to practice. No one ever spoke to me again about me being placed on waivers. Though Jim Brown was the consummate team leader, it was still Paul Brown's team. The fond relationship between the two giants would diminish as the star running back's influence grew. Paul was Julius Caesar. He was a ruler. And I was a very determined person, set in my ways to a certain degree. So we always had a little edge in our relationship. Now Jim always has to test everybody that first day, and he's got a couple out here that are going to require some testing. Paul started his meeting, and Jim comes in the door. And he says, Jim, you're late. And the man named Brown that runs this team, his first name is Paul. Well, as funny as we all thought that was, that you could not have heard anything in that room. As a rift grew between Jim and Paul Brown, a lifelong friendship formed between Jim and his backfield teammate. I met Jim in 1958, and when I walked into the training facility, the first guy I looked across and saw was Jim Brown. And I said, holy smokes. <laughs> when you see a massive star like that, uh, my first thought was, what do they want with me? Right away, I loved his talent. He was a 
different kind of runner and had unbelievable track speed. He only won about nine carries and I needed about 25. That made us very compatible. On the football field, we loved each other to death. It was almost like we could read each other. We had an off-tackle play for me to sneak through on the defense. So he faked Jim out on like a flip and handed it back to me. I had to break away because I can't get up the hole. I ran by Jim Brown and just handed him the ball. He goes the opposite way for 60 yards. The two men may have loved each other, but the relationship was far from perfect. The Cold War between Jim and his coach saw to that. Paul dominated all of his players. There was one guy he couldn't dominate. Many times he put me in the middle of things so he could set things to Jim. So he might jump on me and scream at me about something, but it was always when Jim was next to me or somewhere, because he's really talking to Jim. Brown and Bobby Mitchell shared the backfield for four seasons before Mitchell was traded to Washington. I hated the fact that they traded him. I didn't understand it. But they had, we had Ernie Davis coming in Best known as Ernie Davis, the league's number one draft choice and the first Negro ever to win the coveted Heisman Trophy. They said uh, Green Bay had Horning and, and Jim Taylor, so we're gonna be like two big old dudes. Well, I didn't like two big old dudes in the backfield. I thought one big dude and then one little dude that could do all kinds of magic. And so I, it wasn't for the trade at all. Upheaval on the depth chart was nothing compared to what was transpiring in Brown's world outside of football. As he did on the field, Brown would meet these challenges head on. When you look at the NFL now, I mean, it's a league with a very large number of African-American players. Many of the stars of the game are African-Americans. This wasn't the case when Jim played. You know, you had uh, African-American players in a handful of positions. All these old stereotypes, blacks not being smart enough to play quarterback. These were the perceptions. So, Jim was a dominant black star during this time when there weren't that many black players. Gauntlet before the feet of tyranny, and I say segregation now, segregation tomorrow, and segregation forever. I was born black, but I didn't live black. I was trying to live the way that everybody else was living. But there was segregation at that time. There was discrimination. There was unfair situations. There was brutality. This country was a mess. We played the game in Florida. And when the players got through getting their keys, the only people still standing there were the black guys, Jim and all of us. Manager came over and he said, we got a nice hotel for you in Miami. He had never met Jim Brown. <laughs> Jim said, wait, man. And Paul said, no, 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 no. No, 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 we're the Cleveland Browns. We don't separate. So you, you get keys for all of my players. And they came back and they said, we can stay in the hotel, but we cannot go out any of the doors to the beach. And that was tough looking out at that pretty water. <laughs> but that was commonplace. We were coming out of an era 
in the 1950s when the model black athlete had been established around the attitudes of Joe Lewis and Jesse Owens and even Jackie Robinson where they had to go out on the field, go on to the track, go into the ring, do their job and then leave, keep quiet, go back to the black community and don't say anything. Jim Brown demanded his dignity. He wanted the same respect off the field that he got on the field. Uncompromising and unapologetic in his playing style, Jim Brown dealt with prejudice in the same forceful manner. I'm from St. Simon's Island, Georgia, and my grandmother was working for this white family there as a domestic. And I had become somewhat of a celebrity because of my football in high school. And my grandmother said that this family wanted to meet me. So I went out to the house and knocked on the door and they came outside <laughs> to uh, greet me and never invited me inside. <laughs> that was like a blow to my stomach. I did not like that. That told me how I felt about being equal and sharing the rights, the same as any other human being in this country. Jim Brown really represented achievement for the black community and he was so good that it didn't matter what color they were, they had to acknowledge him as, as the best in his field. And that meant a lot to black Americans in the 60s when everything that any black person achieved was questioned as to whether it was significant. But there were no question marks about Jim Brown. When you're facing degradation, you can do three things. You can adjust, or you can be resentful and hostile, or you can resist and fight back. Jim always fought back. And we're better as a nation and as people because, because he fought back. I'm not saying this to say that those roadblocks aren't there, that there isn't like prejudice out there, whatever have you. But you find it a lot easier when you are not concentrating on the prejudice that's there, but you are concentrating on the business principles that should be used. In other words, I don't go into MGM office and say, I'm black, man, give me a job. You're not hiring black people. I go in and say, here's what I have to offer, baby. I can do this, 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 and this. Now, I would like this, this, and this in return. When you, you think about the 60s and you think about athletes and activism, this was the heyday of that era, the political black athlete people remember Muhammad Ali refusing to be enlisted in the military to go to Vietnam. Jim Brown, of course, is the guy who reaches out to Ali. The one great thing I will say about Jim Brown is that whenever Muhammad needed him, he was there. Jim was always a little protective of Muhammad, sort of you know, when I'd see them together, it was always like, you know, the older brother looking after the younger brother, even though the younger brother was pretty confident himself. Ali was a friend of mine and very outspoken, very courageous young man. Ali was anti-Vietnam War and refused to report for service because he was a conscientious objector based upon being a Muslim minister. Jim calls me and he said, get the guys together. We gotta support the champ. The great thing about this, every single guy I called, Bobby Mitchell, Willie Davis, Kareem, Bill Russell, they said, we'll be there. But it came about because of Jim's relationship with the chair. If you go back and look at that picture, this photo was 
the very cream of the crop of not just black athletes, but athletes, period. For me, that picture signifies the increasing willingness of black Americans to come out of their comfort zone and confront the uh, powers that be on issues that were important to us. Well, it's one of the great times in history without us trying to do that. When you challenge the United States government, the government do not take that lightly. But these young people dealt with the principle. They thought Muhammad Ali should have our backing. And that's what we did. Life is a process full of ebbs and flows, peaks and valleys. Jim Brown's peak on the football field is unmatched in NFL history. A defining illustration of Jim Brown, the football player, was his performance in 1965. A career-high 21 touchdowns, a third MVP award, a record eighth rushing title. But this, perhaps his best season, would also be his last. Jim was doing a movie called Dirty Dozen. And Jimmy told us that he'd be back maybe a few days late. So Art Modell called him and said, Jimmy, you're going to be fined $100 a day. You better get back here. Jimmy said, I retired. Nice playing football. That's how it ended. My original intention was to try and participate in the 1966 National Football League season. But due to circumstances, this is impossible. I want more mental stimulation. Uh, I want to have uh, a, a hand in the struggle that is taking place in our country. And I have the opportunity to do that now. I saw so many great athletes who went past their prime and it became a sadness. I was MVP of the league, and we played for the championship two years. There wasn't too much more I could do in a team sport. After being a leading man on the football field, Brown became an actor in Hollywood. He took on the unwritten rules of the movie industry with the same force he'd used to level linebackers. I'm making more money now. I'm a rookie in a new career, a very glamorous career, a career that is more worldwide renowned than football will ever be. I saw the movie industry as a out for whatever desires I would have. You had the same kind of visibility and you could break down more barriers because the movie industry was very segregated and there were things that black actors were not supposed to do. Jim Brown has been underrated in terms of the roles he embodied in the late 60s and early 70s in Hollywood. I mean, to understand what Jim represented, the 60s is really the era of Sidney Poitier. By the late 60s, Sidney Poitier is the biggest grossing box office star in the country. There were things about the image that Portier portrayed in his films that weren't always human. He was like a symbol, a symbol of perfection. What Jim Brown offers is a more physical, perhaps more urban representation of black masculinity. He was sexual, he was powerful, he could throw hands. Wait a minute. I'm hearing my story. Hold on. Wait. Marcus! Oh, 
That's the password, baby. Well, how can I remember all that? Because if you don't, you're dead. You didn't see Sidney Poitier uh, do this. I have appreciation of Belafonte and Sidney and Sammy Davis. They were all great in their own way. But I was a physical actor. I was a hero. And that's the way I looked at it, because we needed that as African Americans. In 1969, he starred in the Western 100 Rifles, and in the process, shattered one of cinema's long-standing taboos. Raquel Welsh was my leading lady, and that was the first time a black actor truly had a major star in a love scene on the big screen. Well, it ain't much different than the Calvary. I do the best I can. Well, that is a hard thing to do. For all the bad things I have said to you. I give you this. My initial reaction to seeing Jim Brown with Raquel Welsh was, I, I wish it was me. <laughs> you know, because <laughs> to see that on the screen was important because it showed a relation between a black person and a white person exists. Uh, for the first time, I think, in a, in a big film, we have a, uh, a Negro and, uh, and a white girl. Hollywood never really faced that fact. This is a step uh, that had to be taken. I'm happy that uh, maybe I'm the one uh, that has taken it. One of the taboos that had long existed in America was this idea that black men were going to take white women. It's really old sort of a stereotype that comes out of slavery. And so to have a film where you have not any black man, but one of the most visible black men in the country have sex with this white woman who's been put up on a pedestal as a white sex symbol was really profound. Brown's movie career spanned four decades and more than 40 films. We made uh, Any Given Sunday in 1999. It was a real pleasure to cast him. I wanted uh, a veteran who could act, and uh, he's the, Jim was, was my choice. I don't think I ever looked at anybody else on that role. When Al's making his great speech in the locker room to the guys in the last game, the Game of Inches speech, the way Jim Brown looks at him, uh, tells you a lot. And he gives Al, because he's Al's shorter, gives him respect. That gives him screen credibility, you see, as a coach, when you have Jim Brown around the coach. Jim changed Hollywood financially. It opened doors because all of a sudden Hollywood realized that there was a black audience that they had been missing all along. He changed a lot in terms of opening up things for black actors. Coming up, Jim Brown helped change football and Hollywood, but changing himself would prove to be much more difficult. Jim Brown may have been the perfect football player, but he wasn't a perfect man. There would be times, even in a discussion, he could get upset if it looks like I might have got the ups a little bit. I was always kind of careful with that because he didn't take to anybody not being dominated by him on or off the field. 
He's a very silent person. As a matter of fact, the gym you, you see on Monday might not be the same gym you talk to on Wednesday. You know, he's done that to me a few times in our relationship. I go, hey, Jim, man, what are you doing? You talking to me, man? Yeah, I'm talking to you. You in front of me talking to you. I met Jim. It was me, Ronnie Lott, and Tennis Smith. We went to his house, and we were um, outside in his front yard playing basketball and 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 doing fairly well. And and uh, <laughs> and then all of a sudden, we noticed a change in Jim. There was a physicality that rose to another level. I kind of backed down. I didn't want any parts of it and stuff. And he was Jim Brown, man, you know, so. And he was still built like a, you know, like a god, dude. I mean, he was chiseled in stone, you know. And we, we got the message. <laughs> we, we got the message. Brown's intense nature resulted in accusations of a darker sort. When I felt that uh, the case was pretty cut and dry, I felt that all the evidence proved that uh, this was a preposterous uh, accusation. Near around the time that his career was ending, a young black woman named Brenda Ayers said that he slapped her. One time, the police were called to his house, and Jim pushed this officer out, out of the door. And another time he had an incident with a golf pro. They argued over the placement of the ball and Jim got a little rough with the golf pro. They did something because they wanted to get a celebrity black male who they haven't broken yet. They've broken most of them, but they haven't broken me. Between 1965 and 1999, Brown faced multiple criminal allegations. And in 2000, after vandalizing his wife's car, he was sentenced to a six-month jail term for refusing court-ordered counseling and community service. We've had our issues. I mean, we've had some things, but he's flawed, but is willing to change. I mean, that's all that any of us can do. The things that I did that was wrong, and there were things that I was accused of that I did not do. And to try to explain it would be to make an excuse for the things that I did that were wrong. But I'll tell you something, as I sit here now, I wouldn't think of trying to do anything wrong. I've learned how to allow a person to slap me, and I've learned how to turn the other cheek. I wish I had the intelligence to apply myself better at a younger age to make better decisions. Brown has used the lessons he's learned to help others. When Jim started to deal with gang members and former gang members, we were averaging in Los Angeles between 12 and 1,400 murders a year. We haven't been over 300 in the last five years. So you're talking about gang banging at its height. And I can remember being on the streets and hearing these stories about Jim meeting with Crips and Bloods at his house. And I'm saying, OK, this brother, is he crazy? but he really wanted to affect change in the streets and he knew he had to get guys out of their environment to open up. When I first met Jim, man, mid 80s, I was a pretty active gang member, right? Had a, had a, had a thriving career in gangsterism, <laughs> right? We pile in these cars and we go up these winding hills of Hollywood, we cross Hollywood Boulevard, we cross Sunset. Mind you, we have never been north of Pico. And we go down this long, beautiful driveway, and there standing in the driveway is the great Jim Brown. And he just opened us his open arms, brought us in his house, and we just sat there and talked based on kind of us talking to him on what the situation was in the streets and him telling us what the situation was in life. 
and he came up with the American. Founded in 1988, Amer I Can was Brown's answer to the epidemic of gang violence in the inner city. I don't think that there could be anything any more important than to keep young people from killing each other. Over what? A red rag, a blue rag? That's a, a terrible mindset to think that there are thousands of young people out there that's willing to shoot someone are willing to go to the penitentiary, as if that is some sign of glory. The approach was to go into the belly of the beast and turn those lives around. We're not going to change this world through guns and soldiers and violence. It will be through love and understanding. And the first person you've got to love is yourself. I was there for a graduation. We met with gang members in a room where it's a pretty heavy conversation. You know, I was worried about, you know, third and five. And this conversation was way, way above that. We traveled all over the country together, meeting with mayors, meeting with wardens, Department of Education representatives, and just pushing and grinding, trying to get the program in various uh, prisons and juvenile camps and schools. He created a tool to deal with the undercurrent of problems, not the symptom of the problem, but the real problem, which is self-esteem, self-worth, you know, and your childhood conditioning. Even when the sidewalk is broken, if there's a little crack of dirt, a flower of blossoms comes out, Jim worked in the cracks and let the flowers blossom. For a man whose influence is so vast, the ultimate change that Brown affected wasn't on football or Hollywood, or even civil rights, but on individual lives. I was sitting in the county jail, and I was about to get out. He said, I got a job for you. I said, doing what, Jim? As a production assistant. A what? Was that PA? What is that? If it wasn't for Jim making me a production assistant, which led to Denny Claremont, which led to Antoine Fuqua, I'll be in somebody's penitentiary, or I'll be out there at Inglewood Cemetery. When people help you, the next thing is for you to help people. As I analyze being on this earth, why are we here? I imagine to be a better person and to help others. I don't know what else is valuable. It's real simple. Brown remains as inspirational as ever, guiding a new generation. We first met at a mutual friend's wedding, and then we got into this great conversation that turned into a chess game. And ever since, we've been chess partners, you know? So I go out to his home, and there's times when we've sat out by the pool and we played chess for six, seven hours straight. I flew out to his home in, in LA, and he sat on the couch, and I'm like a little kid, so I got on the floor. So I would look up to him, and he started explaining things. Jim Brown is giving me a mission. Jim Brown is passing the torch to me to go out and do things in the communities now that he's done. How big is that? He's become a family man. He's got kids. I think he respects other people's space more than he did before. He's mellowed. He has uh, realized we have to take everybody's uh, perspective into consideration before we, we move forward. When you think about historical figures, many of these individuals were excellent in one area. Jim's a guy who managed to impact multiple areas. The change that he represented, I think he's one of the most uh, important athletes and one of the most important cultural figures in American history, plain and simple. Up next. This represents one of the highest moments in my life. 
Well, what do you think? In June 2016, the NBA's Cleveland Cavaliers brought the city its first title in more than half a century. Taking part in the festivities was a familiar face. When Jim Brown handed the Larry O'Brien Trophy over to LeBron James, it was one of the best sports moments in Cleveland history. I don't think there were too many dry eyes at that parade, and of course there were 1.3 million people there. Cleveland's last championship team rose from one of the most shocking firings in NFL history. I have a, a, a simple statement. Uh, Paul Brown uh, will no longer serve in the capacities of head coach and general manager. After the 1962 season, Art Modell bought the team. Before that, Paul Brown was coach, general manager, and may as well have been owner. I mean, he ran the whole thing. Paul Brown had become so rigid at the end that they just needed a different voice. I admired Paul and I listened to him until I thought he had gotten too conservative. There was a difference in, in our relationship because of that. In his first season without Paul Brown, Jim Brown thrived, setting an NFL single season rushing record with 1,863 yards. That greatness was on display from the start of the 64 season, with the Browns winning eight of their first 10 games. The season culminated in the 1964 NFL Championship game against the Baltimore Colts. They had, what, seven or eight Hall of Famers on that ball club. But the advantage is we got them at home. Jim and I, just before we got ready to leave, in comes the Colt Corral. They come as close as you and I are right now, and they play taps. They play taps with us sitting there, right in our face. We didn't say a word. Just before the game, he said, we're going to kick the hell out of them today. Now the game is in the hands of the men. Men like Jim Brown, the greatest running back of all time. Almost everybody in the country all picked the Colts to win. And um, the score was tied 0-0 at the half. And then Brown reeled off a 40-yard run to get things moving. championship game was a great game because it was a team victory. Final score, Cleveland 27, Baltimore nothing. And the Cleveland Browns are world champions. The 1964 team was so vitally important to the fabric of Cleveland because it endured for so long. Uh, you know, to have that stand as the, the last championship for generations and generations of people, it was just held in highest regard and highest esteem. And I want to thank all of you for this representation. I haven't seen the finished product, but I hope it looks like <laughs> <laughs> 
While Brown's football life ends cast in bronze, he intends for his real life to finish where it began. I told my wife when I leave here, I want to be cremated. And she would just throw the ashes into the marshlands of St. Simon's. I'm not interested in people going to a funeral. The purity of my situation is to just leave here and let people think and feel whatever they feel and think. I'm definitely not trying to get validated because most of the things that you do that are really good, people never get a chance to know about them. And if you're sincere, you don't care. Life, like a snapshot, is a gathering of fleeting moments in time. And so it is for James Nathaniel Brown. His cannot simply be categorized as a football life or a Hollywood life or an activist life. It's a full life, a flawed life, a uniquely American life. That is the life of Jim Brown. <laughs> 